Over the past two days, we've heard an awful lot about tapping into children and young people's interest and enthusiasm for mobile technology. And we've also heard a great deal about the need for schools to respond to this interest and look at different ways of engaging them as learners. This morning, Paul and I are going to try and share with you some of the outcomes from our mobile learning project in Durham. And hopefully, through our presentation, show you that some of our teachers are already rising to the challenge. By way of introduction, because I guess um, there will not be many of you who have visited Durham or indeed the northeast of England, I think what I'd like to do is very briefly paint a picture of what you would see if you came to Durham. Um, there's a short video extract which shows the recent past in Durham and its present. I think you'll have seen from the second part of the video, the modern abstract, that there are one or two now iconic landmarks in the northeast of England, principally around Tyneside. Um, and the area has experienced significant economic regeneration over the last five, ten years. But Durham, it's a slightly different matter, and there are still some significant challenges ahead. I'm not going to dwell too much on the slides, but I think it is important for you to understand the context within which the project was developed. Um, we are a rural county, so in some parts of the county, connectivity is a huge issue for us. The pattern of employment has changed enormously over the last five and ten years. And that's introduced an element of uncertainty into education, where once we had some very major employers in steel, shipbuilding and mining, often employing thousands of people we now have a predominance of small and medium-sized enterprises, most of which employ between one and 199 people. So that certainty that people had that when they finished school, they could walk into employment no longer exists. And many of the children who took part in our project live in areas within the county that rank among the most socially disadvantaged in the UK. In fact, if you look at our rates of joblessness, we are well above the national average. And yet, despite all of these um, disadvantages, educational standards are rising, and that seems to go against current thinking. So we were very keen within our mobile learning project to try and test one of the concepts that we had outlined in our vision for secondary education. And this was the concept of one-to-one -one access to ICT, bringing about an improvement in attainment. And so this project was started just over two years ago. It did have as its uh, basic concept and basic tenet the fact that we were trying to raise standards in literacy and numeracy, which are not only low within schools, but low in the adult population. But we were conscious that we were going to try and do that, not simply by measuring assessment results, but by looking at one or two of the contributory factors. And that's jumped. So we were very uh, interested in exploring whether or not giving children one-to-one -one access to devices would encourage independence. It would help them remove some of the formality of, of uh, lessons in school, which we, we thought might be a barrier to the learning, and help raise their self-esteem and confidence. And that's where Paul's going to talk about the outcomes from the, the report, and we're going to refer back to one or two of the examples that we've uh, experienced in school. 
It's rather disconcerting to look at a blank screen on my laptop while I'm talking, so to excuse me if I look at a strange angle. Um, it was quite a large-scale project. Um, we ended up with 700 devices out in schools, 17 different primary schools. Um, and the schools were quite varied, and they had different approaches to it. Much as we'd have perhaps liked them initially to have done the same thing, they, they didn't. And I think we can learn from that. And at the end of the project, the, the pilot finished um, at the end of the uh, spring term, last summer term last year, we could look at the, uh, the different approaches and how much the devices were used and what impact they had on, uh, on learning. All schools um, had some issues, and uh, reading the, the Vector report that, uh, that was done to mobile learning, it, it, it seems very, very similar. At the first stage of the project, technical support was critical. Um, we put a lot of time and money into setting that up, but there's all sorts of problems with uh, wireless connectivity and, and getting, getting it all working to start off with. That faded quite quickly, because I think after about five or six weeks, most of the pupils became quite adept at pairing the devices, reconfiguring them, and being able to solve problems amongst the peers. But that initial five or six weeks was a real challenge for an awful lot of schools. Sharing ideas amongst teachers was, uh, was really important. We had some schools that were clustered together, and they worked really quite well, so the teacher who was working with a class with the devices could go into another classroom where there's a teacher working with the devices, or even after school discuss what was going on, it really helped build their confidence. Where we perhaps had schools that were more uh, physically or geographically isolated, it was harder for the teachers to benefit, and they felt they were isolated. If you're the only teacher in a school, that's faced with a class of 32 kids with devices and something hasn't worked, there's nobody else to, feed, to, to sort of throw the idea off of. So sharing ideas is important. Training was very important, and we ended up putting more time in than we, uh, we initially planned in the project. Uh, the teachers felt that they needed to be really confident with the devices when they were stood in front of their class with them for the first time. Um, and more time to experiment. Whereas with the children, uh, the, the learners will take the device home and play with it and learn how to use it. Obviously, teachers are possibly more reluctant to do that and have probably got a huge pile of marking to do at the same time. So giving the teachers time to experiment with the devices is critical. And finally, the one-to-one -one access. Where the device didn't work, that sometimes didn't happen. If you've got a class of 32 kids and two of the devices break, then you're a bit stuck because suddenly the lesson you've planned doesn't quite work in the same way. So it's about having spare, possibly having spare devices. It might be about thinking about how the schools are organized. One school the devices went into had three parallel classes in a year group and they gave them to the, effectively a registration group. And then in literacy, they weren't in the same set. So the teacher was faced with a class with one third of the um, pupils with a device and two thirds without. And not surprisingly, it had less impact in those cases. So the schools where we think it's had a big impact, what we see is the device in regular use, the children actually making the choice of when they use and when they're not used to use the device. I know it's jargon, but they felt institutionally ready. It wasn't just the head teacher saying that this project was going to work, but you got the staff behind it and the technical support behind them. Perhaps the third bullet point is, is about confidence, and it's about getting past the stage where the teachers are telling the children to use the device. The children have got the devices, and in the schools that use them successfully, quite often it was left up to the children whether they picked up a pen or paper, or whether they used the device, or whether they picked up a book. And I think that's a really intelligent use, and I think that's quite a high level of ICT literacy, giving the children the choice themselves. And the schools that were really successful were, it, were incredibly enthusiastic about the project. I can't stand up here and, uh, and demonstrate that enthusiasm, so I'm going to show you a short video with, uh, with uh, some information about the project. So once you are on Google, okay, I'm going to type in my famous person. So I'm going to do Elvis Presley. So I'll get the keyboard ready. I'm going to ask some people in about 30 seconds to give me one fact about your famous person. It's had a major impact on children's engagement and enthusiasm. And the year group, last year's particular year group, uh, there were a lot of um, underachieving boys who had practically disengaged from the education process and this switched them back on, it really grabbed them and more importantly it grabbed their parents as well. Niall Quinn, when he had his testimonial match, he donated some money to Africa and Asia and local hospitals in Dublin. 
to like a breath of fresh air. I mean, I've, I've used them last year and I've learned how to use them myself, and then this year I feel totally more confident in using them in the classroom. Every lesson we have, no matter what it be, even PE, um, it's a case of, right, have your PDAs with you or have your PDAs on the desk. And I'd say about 70% of the time last year we're using PDAs. At first we gave the children in year two the PDAs. This is children who are only seven and eight years old. Um, we were actually allowing them to take these devices home and they were, they were taking a piece of equipment home every evening. It seemed quite an ambitious thing to give them to year two. And we were a little bit concerned at the time whether those children could cope with looking after the PDAs, whether they could cope with using the stylus and operating the PDA and saving their work into the correct places and that, the sort of logistics of it. And within having those PDAs within a week, those children were coming into school every morning enthused and telling me new things that they'd discovered and what they could use. Noha Cave is where the Stone Age men used to live. There were interesting Stone Age paintings of wild animals. There were music festivals held inside the caves every year. With the class of 35 mixed ability children uh, with a very wide range of ability, everyone was able to use their PDA and get a lot from that. So you put writers found that the word processing meant that their handwriting couldn't be seen, those who find setting out difficult, all that sort of thing, they were able to uh, use their PDA and gain for them immediate success. When I first saw them I thought, oh, there could be a problem, the children might complain about the size. When I used it myself I thought, yeah it's okay, I like the size, it's, it's, it's easy to carry around, it's not big and bulky like a laptop. And the children, I think they thought, yeah they're a bit small, but once they got used to it, and because they've got a mobile phone at home, they're quite used to that. And they just, yeah, they've, they've never complained about it. We have one child who is um, dyslexic, and he has, we have seen his confidence grow because he's actually using his PDA. It takes that burden of writing away from him, and it makes him feel he can achieve. Basically, I would describe it as almost like having an encyclopedia at your fingertips. So whenever they need to know something new, she can access the internet. I also find that when she comes home from school and she tells me what she's done with it that day, there's been a lot of teamwork, which I think is quite nice as the classes come together as one. Sharing homework, sharing stories. If somebody's done an incredible piece of work and the teacher's been impressed with it, they can beam it from one PDA to another. When the teacher's got any resources put together, she could obviously transfer it from her PDA to the children's and they can bring them home and do their homework on them, so they're really quite good. Homework is an absolute pleasure and also they're actually taking their teacher home because often the teacher's recording comments on their PDA. It's a move away from marking books on an evening where the teacher can actually record a message on the PDA and the children can listen to it when they actually get home. One of the things my class loved actually is having their homework marked um, by me using the audio recording. So instead of writing anything on paper or on the screen, I would record a comment, give it back to the children who would listen to it many times uh, and use that to help them to edit their work. Results 1 to 10 of 1,390,000 sites. That's why it came to first. He had to kind of learn what kind of homework was most appropriate for using these devices. The maths was particularly successful in the early days because there was some good maths programs that had been set up for, with the PDA in mind. So it was, it did grow and develop and I think this year we'll see a lot of that being embedded because there are more sites. He's more competent and more aware of what there is around there. So I think that will go from strength to strength. I've got some people over here using the internet through numeracy, I've got internet with literacy, I've got some beaming files, I've got some camera and video recording. Come along to our school and see our children now who are in year four and they're still as enthusiastic today using their PDA as they were two years ago when they first had the PDA and I think that speaks for itself. I think as well staff are highly motivated and I think that's very important to have a staff who want to take it on board and want to develop it further. We are so lucky to be a school who's part this and it's just Words can't describe how much it changed your teaching. It's given me like a, a new lease of life. I just absolutely love it. And the children, when you see the faces doing the different things, it's just, it's totally worthwhile. And we're just so pleased as a school, as a community, that we were part of this project. Okay, so um, that was a couple of the schools that, uh, that use the device devices we think very effectively. There was probably a good half dozen more that were very, very similar. And I know it's jargon, 
but I think the learning style was changed in those schools and the teaching style was changed as well. And I think it was the fact that those schools were prepared to change the way they worked that made the thing uh, successful. I'm very aware of the, uh, the time, by the way. The bits, of, uh, bits that we spotted in terms of the effective use of the devices wasn't that it was the WYSI software that was being used, but it was the basics. It was the basic word processing. The um, audio video recordings, we never thought that um, uh, teachers would give the devices them to take home with the child's reading book and the child would read into it. And a lot of the parents in some of our areas would just sign the reading record whether the child had read the book or not. This gave them a listener because the teacher was taking the device in and listening to the child read. It meant that somebody was listening to them read and it meant that they read the books. That was a completely unexpected finding. So, probably the impacts, big impact on pupil attitude. Turn those kids back on. I heard yesterday about people powering down when they were going to school. I don't think those pupils are powering down with their PDAs in school. I think they were powering up. Where it's worked effectively, homeschool links have been really highly developed and moved on. We've also got some statistics um, that may have resulted from that. The, uh, the columns in blue are the average of the project schools. The uh, yellow columns are the average for the authority. And you'll spot for everything, they're slightly better. That might be because, of course, the schools are forward-looking in the first place. It might have nothing at all to do with the devices. But it's encouraging to see some better exam results. If we look at contextual value added, again, for the year six group that left last year, for the schools that made uh, effective use of the device, you can see the vast majority are above the 100, and some significantly so. Again, I think the Betcher report mentioned this as well. There seems to be a critical mass, certainly in the first few weeks. If you can get over the six or eight weeks barrier and use the devices effectively and overcome the technical problems and set work on them regularly, then it works. If you can't, if, it, if there's not a critical amount of use, then they fall into disuse, then the kids forget to charge them when they go home, technical problems don't get fixed, and then it doesn't work. It's quite hard to relaunch if it hasn't worked in the first place. There has to be a big push at the beginning to make it effective. Some unexpected findings. We wanted the devices to go into year five. So we weren't entirely happy, I suppose, when one school said we were much happier putting them into year two. But actually, you saw from the video, the year two pupils probably cope better than almost anybody else. Um, special educational needs pupils uh, coped remarkably well with the devices. In fact, it seemed to help some of the ones with, uh, with writing difficulties. It got boys to write, and it got the poorer writers writing quite effectively. Um, it's a nice quote here um, that, that says really, and, and I've got the whole quote uh, written down, that really says that what happens in her classroom is that the poor writers will use the device and actually improve their writing with the device, whereas the writers who write copiously will still stick to paper. But it's enabling the children who perhaps would struggle otherwise. So in the other schools where things were somewhat less effective, uh, there were some things that were, were, were issues. On some occasions, the teachers decided that they struggled with the screen size, and therefore their pupils would. And that was a barrier. I think, I think because they felt it wasn't appropriate for them, then it wasn't appropriate for the kids either. Where there was technical problems that weren't overcome quickly, um, the children, are, it, it, they expect are an instant on culture. They don't expect something to disappear off to a repair workshop and to appear six weeks later. They want it now. Um, in some schools, we had several initiatives taking place, and, and there's a certain amount of teacher overload. And again, I think if teachers are going to go for a project like this, it's a major undertaking, and, and I think there's more than enough for them to do. And finally, uh, one of the schools we looked at in the video actually did something that, again, we didn't suggest. They put their devices with the teacher rather than the children. So Neil, the, the teacher on the video, was a year six teacher. And the first time round, he only had the devices with the children for six weeks. And the second time he had a year, and now he's got them with his next year group. And actually, that was very successful, because it's the teachers that have got more adapting and changing to do, perhaps, than the, the pupils. The pupils can pick the technology up really easily, being digital natives. Teachers, it's a bit more of a challenge. Um, we asked teachers did they prefer to teach with the device? And there's a variety of answers. And I plotted the answers against, did they think the children were making better progress? 
And not surprisingly, the teachers who preferred to use the device thought the kids were doing better because of it, and the teachers who didn't like using it then perceived that actually it didn't have an impact on progress. I think probably the message that I get from that is that the teacher is really important, and if they're on board in the first place, and if they're really enthusiastic, they will make a success of it. If they're not, it'll probably be less successful. And again, we ask the same question there. Pupils spend more time on task. We ask teachers for their response, was this accurate or not? And really what I wanted to show you there, there was a wide variety of answers. In some of our schools, they thought that there was a huge improvement. Others thought that it actually detracted. A rather nice Ofsted comment that I'll, uh, I'll leave you to read. I'd have to say it's unusual, actually, coming across an Ofsted at the moment that's actually commented on ICT, but I was right, quite in, impressed with that one. And uh, there's a nice head teacher comment as well, talking about more able and talented pupils and also the others. I want to continue, though, because I'm aware we're overrunning. I've got a brief video to show in a second or two. I think that our pilot is flying, because in the schools where, that have taken this on board, the devices have been rolled out to the following year's worth of kids. I think four or five of the schools involved in the project have invested a large amount of money in another class set of devices, and the year six pupils aren't happy about not having the devices at secondary level at the moment. So I think we've really moved things, and I'd like to finish with a brief video. We're in a technological age. We've got to go for it. You know, they're saying that 80% of the jobs that these children are going to do haven't been invented yet. Well, we have to give them these skills, don't we? That, that they can change, they can try new things, and they're going to. Technology is part of their life. So I, I think it would be really short sighted. If you get the opportunity, go for it.